we'll move on to Andy Ray, who's going to talk about all things BFR. Uh, Andy is Head of Strength and Condition at Pure Sports Medicine, and he's going to discuss the doctor guided smart cuff. So, Andy, I'll pass it over to you. Perfect. You hear me all right? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me again. Yeah, I'm the Head of S&C at Pure Sports Medicine. Um, we're a sports medicine clinic in London. We've got seven clinics, and I just head up the S&C department. Uh, very briefly, my background was rugby. I was a reasonable rugby player when I was younger, and then always training people alongside that. Got less reasonable at rugby as I got older, and then continued to train people as I went. Got the job at Pure Sports, and... Uh, I've been, I've been using blood flow restriction for extensively, really, for a few years now. Um, and, and the fact that it's not more renowned or well-known is, is, is surprising to me, to be perfectly honest. Um, I met Paul. He came to present to us at, um, at Pure. I was using some uh, cuffs which were, well, which what I thought were okay at the time until I used the, uh, the smart cuffs um, and they were very quickly thrown out because the pressures are just completely different. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So the, uh, I suppose the idea for me is just to go through some of the mechanisms which um, how blood flow restriction works um, and then I'll go through some examples of stuff that I've used, um, some other little bits that uh, questions I've been asked sort of on our travels uh, and some of my thoughts on maybe how this could be um, used in a university uh, and some of the holes in the research maybe and, uh, and some ideas on, on where you might aim, um, aim some of the research. Um, I'm sure some of you know, uh, blood flow restriction is a, is a rehab strategy. Um, you put cuffs uh, on the top of your arms or the top of your legs, um, whichever you're sort of trying to target. Um, it lets a lot of blood flow in and then it, it stops it coming out essentially. Now, it sounds, for those of you who haven't used it, it sounds, you know, a little bit barbaric. It's, it's not the most pleasant thing to do, okay, but it has some huge, huge benefits. And I've used it personally. I've used it on a lot of my patients. Um, and we'll, we'll talk through a few of them. Um, but again, just be warned that when you try it, it can be um, slightly unpleasant. But the benefits very much, you know, outweigh the pain. So how does it work? Um, so the lack of uh, venous return causes a swelling in the muscle. Um, metabolites, especially lactate, um, and they, they'll accumulate and stimulate muscle growth. Um, it creates a hypoxic environment. Essentially, it lets the, the blood in, the, the oxygen in that blood is used, and then not much more can come in. Okay, So it, it creates this sort of hypoxic environment, which has a, has a big effect on what sort of muscle fibers you're using. Um, it's, it's, it causes a lot of fatigue very quickly, um, although fatigue that isn't lasting. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little while, uh, and increases to growth hormone and uh, insulin growth factor. <clears throat> so the benefits, increased muscle size. Now, I work in a rehab facility, so you know I'm trying to maintain muscle size, but, more often than not okay so i'll have a lot of post-surgical uh, acls a lot of lower limb okay and, and my main um job is to try and maintain muscle mass or at least sort of decrease the atrophy um the increase in muscle strength i think this this is specific to different populations i think if you were a lot of the research is is in the elderly um I think you can increase muscle strength in, in some populations if you were to get a professional rugby player who'd been training for 10 years. You know, maybe that, that might not work quite as well. But I still think if you're, if you're maintaining size, you have the capacity to build strength or the ability to create force from that size. Okay, so we're just trying to keep that muscle big enough to be able to produce that force. Um, Cardiovascular capacity, again, we'll go through all of these as we go through. A nice one for me, um, like I said, I played professional rugby for a long time. Um, I had 16 pre-seasons in total and, you know, it, it takes its toll. Uh, I use BFR um, a lot on myself. I don't tend to lift heavy anymore. I don't need to. I've got two kids. I don't want to squat and hurt my back, but I do want the same benefits. I do want to stay in shape. So that decreased joint and tissue stress for me, especially, and for also a lot of my patients who are 
um, ex-sports people, uh, people who enjoy running triathlons, um, or even guys in a professional environment who are of that age where they've been training for that long. It's a really nice way of decreasing their load. Um, little to no muscle damage, just as a, that is the case, but if you were to completely flog someone, then there will be a little bit of muscle damage. Um, same with recovery. Um, it's surprising how you feel when you're doing BFR to how you feel afterwards. When you're doing it, it feels like your arms and legs may explode. Five minutes afterwards, it's amazing how good they feel. Uh, and actually with relatively little DOMS the next day. That's the next point. And, uh, and, and low intensity. So we, we can almost create a higher intensity without actually working the body, um, increasing the intensity like in weights or, um, or, or on the bike, for example. So there's, there's a lot of research on blood flow restriction, but as we'll talk about sort of towards the end, a lot of it's in rehab, a lot of it's towards the elderly. Um, but I think there's huge, and, and Gareth will probably come with, in with some examples towards the end, where we can really use this in athletic populations. Um, I think for performance, I think, again, for those uh, older athletes, um, warm-ups, uh, replacements for ice, potentially. Um, again, there's a, there's, a few, there's a list of those towards the end. Okay, so who can it benefit? It can benefit everyone, really. Um, you can use this as soon as... Um, People who are bedridden, okay, so if it was a lot of that for me would be post-op. Um, casted, I've used it for someone who's been a boot, in a boot um, with, with really positive um, outcomes. Pre and post-operation, so again, you can, you can maintain that muscle size and, and potentially strength um, pre and post-op. And in the elderly, it'd actually be really inter it'd be interesting if you were to have a little Google on on some of the studies in the elderly because they're, they're actually quite fascinating. Again, athletic populations, um, we'll, we'll chat about my view on some of these as, as we get through. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk through this as we go. Okay, so, so the, first, um, the first mechanism as it were, okay, so you get an increase in cell swelling, okay? So when the, when the O2 drop, when the oxygen drops, uh, because we're creating that high oxygen environment, uh, we shift fluid into the cell wall, which increases the rapamycin complex, which is uh, essentially, um, a, uh, it, it activates skeletal muscle protein synthesis. Um, interestingly, it also decreases myostatin, which has uh, a negative influence on, um, on protein synthesis. So it actually inhibits it. So we get sort of, well, kill two birds with one stone, really. Um, so fatigue, again, so if you see this, I, I don't think you can see my, my scroller, but the recruitment of local type two muscle. So essentially, when we create that hypoxic environment, we, the type one muscle that needs oxygen, you know, the oxygen is taken away. So we almost bypass that. Okay, so you can, you can, you can get into those big, um, big muscle tissues that grow, but with a really low intensity. Okay, so you'll see in some of the, well, a lot of the research, um, they use 30 to 40, 20, well, 20 to 40% of, of one rep max um, to get into the type two muscle fibers. So I would start to think about how you might use that okay so if people are injured obviously you could use that and you could stimulate those type 2 muscle fibers that maybe you wouldn't be able to uh, with with traditional resistance training um, i know gareth has used it a little bit as a warm-up okay so um, gareth has used it and i know another guy who worked for australian swimming who would use it as a warm-up and then if because they were swimming multiple races in a day they would do one long warm-up at the start but they don't want to fatigue them in the next warm up. So, okay, well, how are we going to get those big, big powerful muscles activated without doing a long and fast warm up? Well, maybe we can use BFR, we can bypass those type one muscle fibers and we can fire people up for the race without actually fatiguing them. Um, I know another thought process in mind specifically was something like a sevens tournament. You know, people will be tired towards the end of the day. And actually I used to play a little bit of sevens and I was exhausted by the, the last game. So could we think about um, 
reducing those warm-ups after the main one and see if we can, you know, like I say, reduce fatigue. So satellite cells, essentially they usually um, respond to, to damage. Um, it's been shown during uh, blood flow restriction training that um, there's increased satellite cell prolif proliferation of type one beyond 10 days as well as type two muscle fibers. So essentially the satellite cells will, uh, when there's damage, um, they'll replicate, form one dominant cell and one that proliferates. And this forms new muscle fiber or repairs muscle fibers. So we can get that muscle, we can get that muscle repair from no damage. Okay, which will come into its own when we talk about tendons and stuff a little bit later. Okay, but we're essentially stimulating muscle growth, but we don't need the heavy loads. We don't need to damage the tissue. We can just use the blood flow restriction and it will give us those satellite cells without the damage. Okay, so essentially on this, the hypoxia and lactate cause an increased expression of um, this growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, now, we this is sort of a little theoretical. This this study is actually in animal studies, but we get hypoxia and lactate uh, from blood flow restriction. So therefore, we we think that there will be an increased expression, um, and it activates capillary and, and blood, uh, sorry, bone growth factors. So you think. So the idea being that it will help, um, yeah, like uh, fractures or it will increase sort of bone healing. Now, if anyone's really interested in this, there's quite a good podcast guy called Chris Caviglio, who's the ex-head of the AIS, um, does a BFR podcast. He does a lot of um, anecdotal, he has people on who use BFR uh, for different things. And actually there's some really nice examples of, um, of, of much quicker healing for fractures while using it. Okay, so if anyone's interested, that might not be a bad, um, a bad listen. So bone growth, so essentially, without going into too much detail here, essentially all we're doing is we're trying to get a bigger contraction from the muscle, which increases sort of the sheer force on the, on the, on the, um, on the bone. So if we can get into those bigger type two muscle fibers, we get a bigger contraction, it puts more stress on the bone. And essentially that will help it grow. We all know that if we can, if we can um, put stress through bones, then they're going to, you know, they're going to become a little bit more robust. So those ones were the um, sort of local ones. Now it does have sort of systemic benefits as well. And some of these are actually quite interesting. Okay. So if we were to, if we wanted to increase the heart rate, for example, now if we were exercising, obviously we would, the heart rate would increase, the blood uh, flow to the tissues would increase, um, and the heart would, the heart would work harder essentially. So when, you know, and if we can put a, a cuff on the arm, it's almost like a false um, restriction. So it, it will increase that blood pressure and it will, it will send a message up to the brain to say, okay, we need more. Okay, so the nice thing about this, I think, is, is if you were thinking about recovery type sessions. Okay, so say you wanted to get the heart rate up, but you didn't want to increase the intensity. I think this is a really nice way of getting some sort of a, an aerobic stimulus. Um, if you were a rugby player, which I know I keep going back to that, but for me, it would be great if you were to do a recovery session and think, okay, well, I don't want to increase the intensity, however, I do want to try and increase the heart rate. I do want to get some sort of stimulus from the aerobic system. Can I put the cuffs on and can I get a little bit of an increased heart rate without putting any more pressure through these athletes? Um, again, this is quite an interesting one really. Um, and I'd sort of draw attention to the VO2 max. I think it is the third from the bottom. So they had, um, these were guys, this wasn't elderly, um, cycling with uh, blood flow restriction at 40% of VO2 max. And that was performed three times a week for 15 minutes. Um, and they had, they, they saw a 6% increase in uh, relative VO2 max and a 15% improvement in time to fatigue. Now that was compared to a control group that was using uh, 45 minutes at the same level. So actually, 
it wasn't volume matched and they still had quite an unbelievable uh, improvement in, in, in VO2 max. Um, I just, I think that's, that's really interesting because if, again, if you think about, you know, going back to that sort of recovery type example, you know, you could potentially be using a recovery session, but actually you would get sort of um, VO2 max benefits, time to fatigue benefits. Um, and if you, if you considered, like Gary said, you're trying to find those little extra two, three, five percent, then you're, you're adding a little bit extra to your recovery session. Uh, you might get some muscular benefits. You might get some tendon benefits, which we'll get into next. Um, and you might get a little bit of uh, aerobic benefit. Uh, yeah, so we've been through this. So the reason this is on the systemic ones is just because it will be in the bloodstream. So you will get some, some benefits around the body. Uh, the growth factor will be carried in the bloodstream. And, uh, and you know, the theory would be that if you had... Um, if you had uh, a fracture on your left ankle and you were to um, do some work through your right leg to try and increase intensity, hopefully you'd have a systemic effect of, uh, you'd get the benefits in your, in your non-broken uh, ankle and you'd get the systemic effects of the, both, uh, the, the growth factors in your, in your injured leg. Uh, we're gonna come back to this in a minute because um, I've got a better slide on this in just a second. So tendon repair uh, is a little bit more theoretical. Um, so if you're giving um, exogenous um, growth hormone, so there's a few studies of, of people being given growth hormone and it shows the, um, the increase in tendon or mRNA expression and collagen synthesis. So the idea being that the increased growth hormone, which we'll get onto on the next slide, will increase those, those tendon and muscle, um, will give you those tendon and muscle benefits. Now, I know Gareth talks a lot about uh, one of the things that BFR isn't is sort of something to be used for, for tendon stiffness. Now, there has been a study recently, um, some of you may have seen about, uh, it can actually have an, uh, uh, an influence on tendon stiffness. Um, and this might suggest that it, that it may have, but I think me and Gareth discussed last time after our last meeting that there's just not enough evidence for now. But still, an interesting thought process that actually, if if you know if you are increasing growth hormone using this um, using this type of training, then you might have that effect, and it may have you know some benefits on on the tendons, you know, as you go. And again, going back to that sort of three to five percent, if you're using it as recovery or you're using it as a deload wig, you may just get those benefits <clears throat> alongside what you're doing. Okay, so this one just shows the increase in lactate. Um, the lactate will lead to uh, the rise in growth hormone. Growth hormone will play a role in uh, collagen production. Um, um, healing tendons, ligaments, bones, muscles, other structures. Okay, so, so the idea being, again, with, with blood flow restriction training, we know that we can increase lactate. Hopefully we can there... You would, the evidence would suggest that then you would increase the growth hormone and IGF-1, which will have all those benefits. Okay, so this is really interesting, this one. And actually, this is something that I discovered a long time before any of this research came out. I had a knee problem and I couldn't lift heavy. Okay, so I was training with a trap bar. I was at about 50% of what I usually would lift. And the next day I had this analgesic effect on my knee. I could walk fine and it was, it, it felt great. Now, I don't think, I'm not sure of the mechanism of this. And I don't, I'm not saying that this is going to heal anything or fix anything. It just has an, an analgesic effect. It lasted for me for about 24 hours. But, and again, it's not fixing something, but at the same time, if someone can move better in that, 24 hours, then you would hope that they would move better, they would get more, um, more range through their joint, they'd get more work through their muscles, they will avoid any sort of compensatory patterns. And if that's something that you had the time to do daily, you might just be able to get them moving slightly better alongside your treatment, like the guys have said, um, just, to, just to 
just give that little bit of relief for for a day or so so they can move well and even it might be able to you know increase their training load or increase the exercises they're able to do and we can we can you know maintain potentially maintain maintain the strength and mobility in that joint but i would implore you to try this because i've had a few patients and i wasn't aiming for reduced pain to be perfectly honest i was just trying to maintain the muscle mass and uh, and they a lot of them do report that this analgesic effect and it's quite relieving for some people um, and i think a lot of people who are very protective about their movement when you can give them something like that it's quite powerful and even if it is for 24 to 48 hours it makes them feel good and it makes them feel like they can move well <clears throat> Okay, so this is just a general, I mean, I'm sure Paul will send these slides through, but this is just a sort of general overview of what I've just talked about. Now, at this point, I would usually do a, a practical, um, but obviously we're on Zoom. So this is how you would, the lower limb. So you would, the, the cuff would go on the top of your leg, right up as high as you possibly can. Now we use a Doppler, which which we think is the best way of well, it is the best way of getting your blood pressure. You will you will um, find your pulse. You will um, pump the the cuffs up until the, the you know you don't hear the boom the heartbeat anymore, and then you would reduce it down. Now, cell swelling, you would go eighty to one hundred percent of that limb occlusion pressure. Okay, now that's for people who are generally not moving. Um, again, I would implore you to have a go at that because every time I go to present, I will get someone to put it on their arm for that five minutes. And it is remarkable what it feels like. You would think that that really would do nothing, but actually it's remarkable what it feels like and actually what it feels like afterwards. With the, um, generally the rep protocol in the research is 13, uh, 30, 15, 15, 15. So I will do 30 reps, rest a minute, 15, rest a minute, 15, rest a minute. <clears throat> now I've actually done a bit of research to why, and I still haven't found out yet, so anyone knows. But I would suggest that because we're trying to do muscle size, it's a hypertrophy based, um, uh, you know, experience. So they want to get sort of high reps. However, as we'll talk about a bit later, I've been experiment with, experimenting with a lot of rep ranges. And I think there's a lot of space in the research to have a look at why we're using those rep ranges. If we're trying to get into those type two muscle fibers, if we're trying to increase um, power potentially in a warm up, can we use different rep schemes than that? And again, I know Gareth has used some, uh, some bits in his warm up, uh, which he might want to chat about afterwards. So your upper limb, which is the UE, you'd use 40 to 50% of the limb occlusion pressure. Um, for lower limb, you'd go 60 to 80%. Um, I would recommend you start at the lower end of that if you were going to try and use this with somebody. 50% um, on your upper limb is, is, um, is quite tough and 80% on your lower limb is quite tough as well. Obviously, people have different pain thresholds. Uh, some people will not like being, it being that, that tight. Um, but it gives you a good basis of where to start from. And then the aerobic intervention. So we'll go through sort of from bedridden to, um, to resistance training a bit, but you'll start off obviously with a bedridden, which would be the cell swelling. Then you might consider going into an aerobic type uh, exercise, biking, walking, um, uh, potentially in the pool, doing some stuff. Um, five to 20 minutes and, and and that would be your occlusion pressure you just literally just put it on their arms and legs or put so if you're doing a low limb you put it on their legs and get them on the bike for 20 minutes again it's not particularly pleasant um but the effects really are quite amazing uh, uh okay so again this is where we'd start step one if they're bedridden you would use the swelling protocol step two you try aerobic walking biking and then step three you'd start to load now the research suggests that it should be 20 to 30 percent of one rep max there's not loads of research out there to talk about going up what i tend to use is sort of a bit of a, a sliding scale so you will start at a high pressure and a low load and you'll sort of come and you'll, you'll sort of meet in the middle and, and by the time you get to the heavy strength stuff i wouldn't have them on frankly I tend to go up to about 70, 75% of one rep max, and then you're into um, 
you into proper resistance training. Um, <clears throat> and I would probably drop it down. I, I tend to drop it down on the upper limb. When I'm lifting heavy, I'll drop it down to about 50%. Again, just these are just some some ideas. I'm sure Paul will send these through for you to have a have a read. But pre-surgical, you were just you're just trying to keep the muscle mass there. Um, so you know, surgery you would have when you're bedridden, you could get them on your legs um, pretty much immediately. Um, and then when you return into play, you can you know you're going for a bit of an increase in size and strength. And then performance for me, again, there there might be some. If you're trying to strength train, I would strength train without them if it was heavy, heavy. But I still think there is some, there's some place for, firstly, some research. And secondly, um, um, so, yeah, some research and some ideas on, on how you can use this in a high performance environment. Because I really think people are missing out. Okay, again, just some guidelines of, of how often you can do things. And again, these will be in the pack that have been sent. Um, Again, contraindications and indications is just something to, I won't bore you with the details, but something that you need to have a, a good look through, um, whether you can use it or not. Um, but just, I suppose, the idiot's guide to using it is just be sensible and start at the lower, lower end of the pressures. Okay, so if you know someone's a little bit delicate, if you know that they probably don't, um, they don't have a high pain threshold potentially you know we don't want to put it so tight that you're going to cause like nerve injury pain like serious pain skin breakdown things like that it's really just being sort of sensible with it really and starting certainly starting at the lower end of the scales that they offer okay so i use this as other ideas or research ideas again we've talked a little bit about sort of potentiation warm-up can we can we use this instead of going into a very long, uh, very high intensity warm up? Can we use it if people are doing multiple races in a day, multiple races over a few days? Um, the recovery side of it, again, I've talked in, in quite a lot of depth about that. How we use it with athletic population. So I've sort of tried using weights for myself, gone down to sort of three sets of eight, four sets of eight. Um, how we might implement that sliding scale, how we might use it for older athletes. Um, another interesting question. So I was on a presentation and Paul was with me the other day. Um, there's not loads of research about females. Um, there's a little bit, um, but most of it's done with, with men. Um, so that might be a nice place to look into for the research. Um, more bits on tendon stiffness like i said i think there's not enough data out there for us um, uh, to, to to say whether this is true or not but it would be an interesting uh, thing to to try and back up sorry going back to females i also got asked if there's anything um based around their menstrual cycle and whether you know when their hormones are higher and lower i think that'd be a really interesting uh, project uh, and an ice replacement interestingly enough so Essentially, if we're using ice, what are we trying to do? We're trying to um, move blood away from the injured area. <clears throat> so it would take a little bit of uh, playing around with different positions of the, the cuffs, but I don't see why that couldn't have been used. And I think, so this one's just the study at the bottom. Uh, it's just the, the, the Achilles tendon study, if anyone wanted to have a little look at it. Um, yeah, I hope I didn't ramble too much. If anyone's got any questions, go for it. Thanks, Andy. Anyone got anything to add? Or? All right, let's jump in. Um, I just wondered with um, you mentioned about obviously using Doppler as the ideal sort of scenario. I just wonder what what do you do in the absence of Doppler? So if you've got somebody with I'm not saying like with a traditional tourniquet type um, stuff that you'll see that all the uh, bodybuilders using and that type of thing, but if you haven't got Doppler or access to it, sort of ultrasound or any sort of process of measuring um blood pressure i guess yes. um how would you sort of work with it what sort of pressures would you use specifically so i went, so I went on there's quite 
again, I'll go back to this guy called Chris Caviglio in uh, Australia. He's got a website. If you have a look, at, if you look him up, he's got a, a nice uh, Excel spreadsheet and you can do some, um, some limb, you can measure the limb um, breadth and there's a few other little bits in it. I can't remember exactly how I used to use it before I had the Doppler. But so really, that's a really interesting spreadsheet to have a little look at um, and, and, and try that. I mean, I think the way that blood flow restriction um, training is going, especially with smart cuffs, the new, um, the new, you don't actually need to use a Doppler for the for the new ones. There's a there's an attachment that you can put on which does it all for you. I think that's probably going to be the way it goes. Um, regarding guessing, again, I would have a look at that spreadsheet. Um, to be honest with you, if not, I'd be a little bit careful. I know some people sort of recommended seven out of 10 pressure, but I just, I think that's a dangerous way to go, frankly. And if you're yeah. in an environment where, you know, rehab environment where you're being, um, <coughs> et cetera, um, then it, it would be well worth thinking about um, something a little bit more objective. I hope that answers your question. From experience around different parts of them. The world that we operate in, what attracted us in a lot to the, the smart cuffs kind of setup was that when the FDA kind of sort of looked at, so I think there's now three, there used to be just the two systems that are FDA listed. So with Delphi, clearly you've got a history, all came out of orthopedic surgery and, you know, tourniquets and, and that kind of situation. So when they, what we liked about this from our model point of view was that the the FDA uh, process required the smart cuffs business to validate itself against the Delphi so that they could claim equivalence so that was for us it was a massive tick in the box because we you know we've got a reasonably big business in Asia and we'd seen tons of work over the years coming out of uh, Japan in particular and the thing that kind of concerned us a little bit is that when you start getting into limb occlusion pressures, it is quite surprising how different people are and how different one side to the other side is even. And so when we started doing our deep dive into this technology, um, for us that was a, a big thing, that you're starting with a reference point that's personalized to the patient. And then as Andy says and, and Gareth was saying, you start low and progress up depending on what you're trying to achieve. And then the other piece that attracted us in, obviously, was the, the development pathway. Well, you know, next generations, it's fully automated. It's also retrofitable to the cuffs as they are today. But we think that's going to be quite a big step uh, where you're actually saying to people, look, this is a medical device. It's regulated to these pressures, but it's personalized to you. And you go to your physio, your strength and conditioning coach, or whoever it is, and, and we supply them through them to the patient, not to the patient direct. It may develop all the time that way for us, but we're trying to be quite conservative uh, and a little bit responsible in just how we, we take it forward. Because if you get it wrong, you're going to create some, you know, some effects that you really don't want to see. Just to add to that, like I said, I was using the occlusion cuffs before I met Paul, and the, the pressures when you pump those up to the same pressures you do on the smart cuffs, it's totally different. I mean, okay. like a world apart. Yeah, so I would, again, if I would suggest that the best way to do it is, you know, either with the Doppler or the new the new stuff that, that Paul's got where it does it for you, which sort of yeah. takes a little bit of the, the, the leg work out of it. But again, yeah. if you're being audited or, you know, or you're... It, you're sort of doing research and bits like that, you know, you want to have a, a good bit of kit that you know is going to be um, reliable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think from, certainly from a research perspective, you want to try and be as, as accurate and um, reproducible as possible, I guess, um, in the grand scheme of things. And I guess I'm just thinking where you've maybe got your smaller clinics and places like that that maybe can't, in, for the best will in the world, maybe afford some of the sort of the better kit like this, where you've got Doppler or you've got the automated systems. It's just kind of trying to get that. Um, I guess the more you can get the BFR out there, the more likely people are to go for the better kit um, yeah. eventually. 
they can see the benefit of it working. So I guess it's trying to get that um, basic kind of underpinning idea as to how it works and what kind of pressures to work with and then sort of get them to buy into it a little bit from there, I guess. Because once you, if you can get patients through the door and you can see people using it and it working, then they're going to invest in something better that then hopefully sort of is also safer, yeah. I guess. I mean, one, one point I'll make at this point and then I'll shut up. But <laughs> I mean, the, other, the other thing from our point of view was if you take any new technology over any period of time and you look at you know how it gets adopted or doesn't get adopted, there is clearly an economic equation that if you tick the box on you know the clinical side, you, you tick the box on uh, the how do you train it side so that it's safe. You know, it's a huge part point that if you're looking to, if you're asking someone to invest six thousand pounds for a Delphi system, it's a very limited market. So with smart cuffs, we started off with five sizes, ten so ten cuffs in five sizes, with a Doppler, with the bag in the case, and all the training that came with it, and we positioned that at fifteen hundred quid plus VAT, but that includes the training. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we were able to offer people the ability to lease it, even if they're in a clinic. You know, it's not a big amount to go after. But what, where we've kind of ended up is that for most clinics, uh, your sizes two, three, and four are probably going to cover the vast majority of what you want. So that then brings you down to the sub one thousand pound area. And when okay. you're in that, you know, when you're in that kind of level of investment. It starts to pay for itself very, very quickly. I think just my point, I suppose my other point on that is if you're going to, if you invest it, you need to get everyone in, if you're in a clinical environment, certainly to invest in it. Something that I sort of struggle that we're good now. We, we all use it now. But, um, but yeah, I think you've got to all buy into it in a clinical, in a clinic, yeah. certainly. Uh, firstly, to get the best use out of it. But if someone's coming in and getting blood flow restriction training from one physio and he's not getting it from another, you know, it... Exactly, yeah. So, so I think just, yeah, get buy-in across the board if you're in, certainly in a clinical environment. Get people trained up well. Get people using it as soon as possible and keep it... Um, keep it within people's sort of vision almost so they're, so they're always thinking about it. because as with all sort of new equipment people will see it, it will create conversation for a little while and it will sort of drop off as they go back to their usual uh, their usual sort of clinical stuff um, but if, if, if it can be seen in the environment in, in the clinical environment everyone's using it then, then you get more patient buy-in for one but um, also everyone across the team is given the same level of service really I think from my perspective, Alan, as someone in academia, I think this has been part of the appeal of certainly engaged with Paul in that there's been a willingness to, one, discuss research to back up the claims and the products and also about, the, I suppose, the engagement with how we can make take the product to the next step and that sort of stuff, but also just, just that general desire to ensure that there is, I guess, that kind of clinical guidance of so the training that comes in and sort of that willingness of, I'm not just trying to sell you a product, but actually we are gonna, we're gonna ensure you know how to use the product. Uh, so I guess whether that's to me as an academic wanting to then roll it out to my students or whether or not ultimately it's the students that go on to become the clinicians and to go, actually, I remember using that, that'd be great. I'm gonna get some myself, but actually here's some guidance and here's some, I guess we're trying to work towards a shared goal of the evidence and the research and the product to teach clinicians how to use it safely so we get the maximum benefit out of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was also gonna, also gonna add just to coming back to the, the Doppler and just kind of accurately assessing thing. One of the things that I found is when um, I actually regularly remeasure the, the occlusion pressures after about three to four weeks. And um, part, part of the, the reason for that is once you've been doing um, um, blood flow restriction training, you actually get an increase in the capillary density. Um, of, of the muscle and actually the muscle is therefore able to tolerate more so if you're if you're kind of guessing you've got a lot of adaptations which are taking place while you're actually using that and if you want to have the um the, the best effect really you've got to be you've got to be measuring that um, um accurately um over a period of time so i think you know for 
uh, for us, we, you know, um, I found with, with, with the artists that we're working with, they, they, they do reach a, a plateau with that. But certainly in the, in the clinic as part of rehab, for instance, particularly if people have been, you know, uh, haven't done anything, they've been bedridden for a while, and then you're, you're starting to do that. You actually need to keep remeasuring uh, because the limb occlusion pressure um, definitely changes and, and quite significantly in, in some cases. I've had someone who went from like 140 million, you know, uh, million mercury um, limb occlusion pressure to about 190 uh, in, the, in the space of about uh, seven weeks. So again, if I'd been kind of just guessing at it and left it at that, I don't think would have had the same kind of adaptation and, and, and level strength. So it's, it's just one of those, and I completely support what Andy said about clinic engagement. I think um, I'm fortunate as a clinic owner, <laughs> if something comes into the clinic, everybody is going to do it. <laughs> um, and, and, but again, it's, it's, it's an in-service, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, and, but it's still up to the, you know, to the physios to, to do it. But we try and say, look, this is, this is our way of doing things and may regularly. And one of the ways we've gotten around it is actually to sit down and develop protocols together. Um, and kind of talk about what we do this and how and and that and, and I think people use things they understand. Um, uh, people if they don't necessarily understand it, they it's it, they're less likely to use it. And um, and um, Andy keeps coming back and making a point: try it yourself, try it yourself. All of them have tried it, um, and when they try it, actually is when you get a much better um, idea of what it feels like. You know how much it it, it works, and uh, particularly when it comes to the you know um, the the pain relief um, um, aspect, which was an interesting one. Um, and you know my my theory theory on it is that you just you know we we talked about recruiting um, muscles a lot. You get a lot of muscle recruitment. So for that twenty four to thirty six hours after you've used that, you're really almost in a heightened state in terms of muscle function and the way you've recruited more of the muscle to do the same task, and that kind of reduces the uh, the load on the <laughs> And um, this, oddly enough, um, reduced a lot of the pain um, during during that. Um, but uh, similarly, uh, just in terms, uh, she had a big change in her occlusion pressures over over four weeks as well. So, Thank you. I think um, from from what I I know about BFR, the, the scope for the use of BFR is far greater than what I actually realised, and I think that's down to the education side of it as well. So obviously that's why we're looking at Brendan and you know universities to try and educate the next generation that's going to use the, this technology. Um, because like I mean, when I look at it and you see people using BFR, it's always elite athletes. It's always you know the people at the top end of the game. And then when you look at what what Andy's saying about you know uh, even old people, bedridden people, and all that kind of stuff, it's not something that you, us really consider. And I think that's where you know the education side of it comes in. Um, Less sexy to post that on Instagram, isn't it? Here I am, right? my granny in bed with the BFR, oh, yeah. and that's. Aye. That's kind of one of the, the, the realities, isn't it? It's yeah, just, absolutely. It's just right. sexy, but actually it's, it's probably the reality. It probably is more beneficial. Yeah. Well, I know from, uh, you know, our, at our clinic, our researchers are now looking into, um, there was a bit of research on um, ACL recovery. Um, I think it was three weeks post and they still lost quite a bit of muscle. I think it was five to 6% muscle mass in their quad. And they're trying to do some research with St. Mary's now to try and get it, get it on immediately after ACL surgery and see if they can get some research about whether you still get that, that loss. And that's something that the team here are planning to do. So, um, there was a, Andy, there was a paper that, uh, I think is still out there and it was an NHS sponsored, uh, piece of work and they were looking at, uh, ACL and they had two very nice match groups and, um, it, you know, that kind of research, yeah. It is out there. I want to see if I can find that paper. But again, in the clinical setting, in a, the everyday world, 
Um, you know, Brendan's right. You know, having LeBron James sitting with me, Malcolm yeah. X. Yeah. You know, he's going to get millions of people on it. But the other side of the equation is that, you know, the people that really can benefit from this is pretty deep uh, when you look I mean, at it. And it's relatively low, low cost. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. But I still think actually some performance teams are missing. You know, missing. I mean, we yeah. went to we went to Worcester didn't we, the other day, and, and yeah. I don't think they're using it enough yet. No. Um, and then, you know, so you know, I think I think there's I think people are missing out if they're not. I mean, we're not saying BFR is a be all and end all. It's just a tool. But actually, for recovery purposes, maintaining muscle mass for that, for for the for the the long term rehab, it's just that's such a huge influence. You know, I think. I was surprised actually that, that they weren't using it more to mm -hmm. be honest. But I just feel like they're sort of you know they'd be missing out. So. I think that's yeah. where the education bit is really strong though, and, that, and that's you know whatever we've done, we, we've you know we've not always made it successfully, but you know where it has worked well is where you're you're laddering the education, so it's not a one shot. Mm -hmm. It's a one shot to get you going, and then it's feedback, and then as well. Let's look at a cohort of patients and see who responded, who didn't respond, ask the questions why, refine it, take it forward. And, you know, that cycle is pretty powerful when you get uh, a lot of people around a, uh, an approach or a technology that are willing to kind of share those ideas and, and take them along. How, uh, just as a question, Paul, uh, yep. how open to providing, for example, such as like a research grant might win back become? It all depends on, well, I guess the, the yeah. short answer is it all depends okay. on. And I mean, the things that we would sit down and look at would be, you know, if you think of our business now, so we've got 110 yeah. people in it and we're in lots of different places. So we would be looking for something that had a big impact. Yeah, no, of course. And that's, that's just saying, like most sort of research grants, there's got to be an application process and a value exactly. to it and, and that yep. sort of stuff. But yep. I weren't sure whether or not it was, if it was a point that has been discussed or is open for discussion or consideration, I guess, does the products grow and the company grow and, uh, and that sort of stuff, really? No, it, well, it's, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to do this, kind of first reach out into the, the sort of educational side of things is that, you know, you know, we would love to be doing with what we're doing with you, Brandon, across quite a few mm. different places. And we need to bring something to the, to the party as yeah. well as the technology. So uh, the, the short answer is open, but bearing in mind that everything gets... Early days. Yeah. 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 Just um, while you're on that study that you were talking about, the NHS one, Paul, was, um, it was one of Luke Hughes' ones from his PhD. Right. Um, right. He's down at St Mary's. That he did that. Yeah. So, but they used Delphi, I think, didn't they? So, oh, they did. but, yeah, yeah, it was a Delphi study. Yeah. Yeah, it gets um, gets the stuff known. Um, it gets people talking about it. Yeah, and that's the bottom line because what we're saying is, if the FDA tells us that there's an equivalence here and it's a rigorous process, you know, the, the other piece of being a medical device is, you can't just chuck it on the market. You've got to yeah. do design validation. You've got to do you got to show why your cuff is four inches and not two inches. You got to, all of that stuff means that it's built into the product. Um, and again, from a price point of view, it's just saying if you're taking BFR into the NHS around that cohort of patients, that's actually quite a cost effective uh, outcome. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to really come on because I think that was that was going to be one of the things that I, I really think around the education institutions. Um, we know that the, the, the one major thing that works is exercise. So we know 70% of people will get better with exercise and that's the NHS model. They, they, it's based on research and that's, that's what they're doing. If there's a way actually to now say, look, yes, you're going to do exercise, but um, this is something that's going to facilitate it because large, the people that don't do well are basically the people that can't tolerate the load. Um, and in in large in large parts, so actually something like this has application. We're not talking about elite athletes; we're talking about the entire popu you know population of, of people. And that generally starts, you know, when we start to go down, you know, specific orthopedic cases. Uh, we could look at you know care of, of the elderly. We can start to even look at you know things like Parkinson and people that have balance problems. Yeah because they're losing you know, a lot of, uh, of muscle, muscle strength. Um, it becomes 
uh, you know, a myriad of, of, of applications and, and certainly like research, uh, research opportunities um, uh, around that. And uh, that's, that's something really, you know, which would uh, interest me uh, greatly is just because, you know, we can, you know, people that are saying, oh, I want to start running a, a 10K and they're doing from absolutely nothing. <laughs> and uh, is there a way to help them, you know, with just, if you're just looking at the, the general public, can we help the person who's sitting in the office and is going to develop RSI? You know, because uh, repetitive, repetitive, you know, strain doing the same all the time. Um, there's uh, some multiple applications uh, around here now. I mean, one, one of the things that you may or may not have seen on LinkedIn is this whole uh, G-Move suit that we've developed for, well, principally it's taking uh, sort of the whole neuromuscular challenge post-stroke patients, people have got Parkinson's, you know, but they still have movement. So we, we've developed a system called the G-Move suit. I don't know if you could put the website in there, question for everybody. So you're using intermittent compression on the calves and on the quads and on, and on the hamstrings. Almost imagine a, uh, a kind of normatec that you can wear. So it's almost like an exoskeleton with a compression system they wear. And it, the difference in people when you see them actually beginning to just use what they've got uh, has been quite remarkable. There's quite a lot of stuff was on the one show a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Fridays ago. Um, so from our point of view, BFR is quite a big area and it touches a lot of different people and uh, therefore it has a long way to go. And there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of mileage in this area for people's health and recovery and all those kind of good things.